Good morning. I am Dennis Schmidt, the pastor of Dubuque Community Church, and the title of today's message is Delighting in Your Weakness. That's kind of a weird title, isn't it? Well, today's slide, our first slide, is going to be a picture of a thorn, if you can see it there. Uh, I have some of these on my property. Uh, they are, they're a thorn that's a very particular variety called a multi-flower rose, multi-floral rose. It's a pretty name for a very cruel plant. And if you've ever tangled with one, you know what I'm talking about. This particular type of rose is very hardy and it's an invasive perennial shrub that can put out canes up to 10 feet tall. And uh, when they hook into you, you will stop. They, you won't keep going. They will stop you in your tracks and then you gingerly try to unhook yourself without getting hooked further in them and losing more blood. They often like to take a little blood when they, when they get a hold of you. Well, no one ever brags about having thorns on their property, and I don't either. But we're going to talk about today that, there's, that God allows thorns in our lives for a very important purpose. And uh, we're going to set the thorns aside just for a moment now. And we're going to, I'm going to ask you as we're going through the, you know, God, people come to me all the time and they say, if God is so good, why did he make such a hard, cruel world with all the challenges of this world? Couldn't a loving God make a perfect world where everything, where there's no sickness or disease or, or other heartaches that we have to suffer through in this life? Couldn't he make a world without all that? And the answer is, he did. He did make a world like that. But mankind, our, our original parents, Adam and Eve, they were not satisfied. They wanted something more. And because of this, they rebelled against God and followed Satan. And they destroyed the perfect world we had. And we're going to look at that today. And we often think, foolishly, if we just lived in a perfect world, then, er, then we would make perfect choices. So we love to blame God that he made a bad world and that's why we make bad choices. But Adam and Eve proved that theory wrong when they lived in a perfect world and made a terrible, terrible decision. So today we're going to start out by looking at the problem and looking at where the wheels fo first fell off the cart. And right at the very beginning, Genesis, the first book of the Bible, Adam and Eve are about ready to get put in the garden. But in Genesis 1, 11 through 13, it says, Then God said, Let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seeds in it according to their various kinds, and it was so. Well, we know that, uh, that God had already created the universe and had given light and now he is creating all the seed-bearing plants and trees. And I really believe in, uh, with all my heart that we wouldn't even be able to comprehend how beautiful all of these trees and plants that God had made. We're going to see this as we go to the next verse. It said, the land produced vegetation. He originally created it, and then he created it so that it would regenerate itself. Plants bearing seeds according to their kinds and trees bearing fruits with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Well, God did this on the third day and God saw that it was good. And you know, when God says something is good, you know it's not just good, it's perfect. It's very, very good. Well, this is on the third day. But on the sixth day, God does some other creating animals and other things. But then on the sixth day, God, uh, it says that this, And the Lord God commanded the, whoop. Okay, there we are. And the Lord God commanded the, tr the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden. So, and, uh, so he gives them that command because... We're going to see why in a moment. He said, you're free to eat from any tree in the garden. So man had all the food that they wanted. But then it says, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will surely die. Well, 
God knew what was going to happen if they ate of that fruit of that tree. And by the way, they had all these tree, tree all the, every fruit you can think of, pears and oh, every kind of fruit you can think of, apples and everything, oranges and all that. But uh, he said, you can eat from any tree in the garden, but from that one tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you must not eat of that tree. You must not eat from that tree. And you know what? They knew good already. It was the evil that God was trying to protect them from. And that's why God makes boundaries. It's there to protect us. It's not there to stop us from having fun. So he said, from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you must not eat of it. For, and he tells us why. For when you eat of it, you will surely die. Well, he said, if you eat that, uh, up to that point, man was created to live forever. There was no sickness. There was no disease. There was no death. There was no uh, fighting uh, between husbands and wives and all these things. But God was trying to protect us from that. But man thought they knew better, and they decided to go forward. And then they did bring death and sickness and disease into the world. And we know that Adam and Eve, they made a catastrophic a decision. I mean, that, that's even an understatement. And just as God had warned them that these dire consequences were coming, so they were about to come. And you know the thing we need to learn from this right here today is we're not back in the garden, but we need to heed God's warnings in our own lives today. We, this is why I, my, I have given the rest of my life for teaching the Word of God. We need to know the Word of God and then we need to listen to the Holy Spirit and listen to his warnings because what God says is what happens when you don't is in Hosea. That's not on the screen here, but in Hosea chapter 8, verse 7, it says, They sow the wind and they reap the whirlwind. whirlwind. The stalk has no head. It will produce no flower. God knows that when you do some of these things that he tries to warn us not to do, it's only going to produce bad results. And so he tries to protect us from it. Disobedience to the clear commandments of God will make your life look like a tornado went through. That's what Hosea was trying to say. And I, my life was that way at one point in my life. But thank God we're going to see that today. There's a thing called repentance. There's a thing called changing your mind and turning back to God. And God puts his arms around you again and delivers you again. Praise God. That's the good news that we want you to know today. Well, to Adam he said, Because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat it of it all the days of your life. Well, the curse was not just on humanity. But because God had made man a steward over the whole earth, that when man fell, the earth fell as well. And it too had a curse on it. And uh, uh, yeah, it says, and what's going to happen? It's going to produce uh, thorns and thistles for you. Well, here we go. Now we see this thorns and thistles. That Remember we talked about the thorns right up front. There weren't any thorns before, and now it's gonna, you're going to have thorns and thistles that's going to be coming. Now the multifloral roses and all the other things are going to be go there. And then it says in the next verse, By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. Well, today in Iowa, it's unusually warm. It's like 90-some degrees here in the early part of May. And uh, so we know about sweating. There's a lot of sweating going on today. But it says you're, you're going to earn your uh, living now by the sweat of your brow. Before, work had a lot of joy in it, but now it was going to challenge that person's strength. And here's what I want us to see that God, actually, by kicking them out of the garden, it was a blessing in disguise. And it'll take some moment to even think about this. But if Adam and Eve were in the garden, they still had all this time on their hands. That You just think about it. If you know anybody that has a lot of time on their hands, they'll end up getting themselves into more trouble. 
because they have too much time on their hands. When I was growing up, I grew up, uh, uh, we had uh, nuns, the teachers the teaching us in school, and I remember that one thing that I remember what they used to tell me all the time is that idleness is the devil's workshop. Boy, when you're idle, that's when the devil can get you to do all kinds of things like that. So God was actually, by making them have to work, was actually delivering them from having so much idleness on their time. So it says that you're, uh, and then it goes go down to the bottom. It says, for dust you are, and dust you will return. And we know that's pretty clear. We see that so true today, and that's how, how, how clear that the word of God is. Well, that, that's how the problem, that's how the wheels fell off the cart. Now we're going to start talking as we're heading into the solution. And we're going to jump ahead about 2,000 years. And we're going to talk, uh, look at a man named Paul. Paul had originally persecuted the church. But at, and, he, and he had made a terrible mistake. And I don't mean just persecute. I don't mean saying something mean about him. He was literally killing Christians. So he was literally sinning against God, killing Christians. And yet then he has a personal encounter, encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ, which is what we all need to have, that personal encounter. And he repented and he turned from his sin and God uh, began to use him in a mighty way as a great missionary for the, for the cause of Christ. And uh, God's about ready to give him an amazing revelation to, uh, to uh, show him how much that he had been forgiven and to give him the courage to live in this fallen world where we're at. And here's Paul's testimony. We're going to go into the next part of it, and here's the solution. And here's Paul talking about, he said, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Well, uh, whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. Well, if you know your Bible, you know that the third heaven is the heaven where God dwells. The Bible uses the word heaven in three different main categories. And the one is when it talks about in the heavens, like in, in, in James chapter 5, it talks about uh, Elijah prayed for rain and the heavens poured out rain. Well, that's our atmosphere. That's the air right around us. The, the, the up in the uh, upper, when you look up in the air, that's the heavens. So that's one heaven, but that's the first heaven. And then there's a second heaven, and that's uh, the, the, where the moon and the stars and the, uh, everything, when you look up in the sky at night, uh, there, that's in, in Matthew 24, if you want to look at it to confirm that, it talks about the heavenly bodies being shaken, the stars are going to be shaken. That's the second heaven. But here he is, he's saying this man was caught up to the third heaven, and the third heaven is where God in his fullness dwells. This is the throne of room of God and this is where our almighty Yahweh where he lives and so here is this man that Paul's talking about who was snatched up in and saw heaven and by the way that's how real heaven is uh, he went there he saw it but then it says whether he was in the body or not in the body I do not know God knows he was not sure I mean, it was, he was so probably amazed <laughs> that he wasn't sure whether it was a dream or a vision, whether he was actually there or somehow God just showed it to him. But here's what I like. It says, I don't know, but God knows. What's that Paul saying? He said, the things that I saw, God knows how real they are. Verse 3, and I know this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows. God knows, God affirms that what he is saying now is correct. And as me and my, as I'm getting up in my years, um, I'm excited. There is a place called heaven. The Apostle Paul already seen it. It's real. It's there. Well, then he goes on to say he was caught up to paradise. And by the way, if there was any doubt when we're talking about the third heaven, what it is, he's talking now he was caught up to paradise. And he heard inexpressible things that man is not permitted to tell. Well, 
uh, talks about paradise. And if you know your story about the repentant thief that was hanging on the, cro on the cross next to Jesus, uh, at some point, at first, he was railing on Jesus, and then later he repented, and he began to say, we, we, we are getting, he told the other thief, we're getting what we deserve, but this man is innocent. He recognized who Jesus was. He recognized that he deserved what he was getting. And then he said a really important thing. He said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And I think all of us that know the Bible at all know the wonderful answer. Jesus said to him, this day you will be with me in paradise, in this place, in, in this place uh, of called heaven. So he said he was up there. He was caught up into paradise, this man was. And you know what it said? He saw, uh, heard, it heard inexpressible things. And the reason it was inexpressible was, how do you begin to explain heaven? <laughs> you know, we sit here and we can say, well, this flower was pretty or something like that. But it was so beyond anything that he could even begin to explain that it was really beyond words, I guess is the thing, what he was trying to say there. And then he said it's also not permitted to tell. And some of it was so awesome that it was not even, he was not even per permitted to tell us. And I say this, and I've said it before, and I believe it with all my heart, that the reason God does not sh share with us more what heaven's like, he doesn't spend a lot of time in the Word of God telling us what heaven's like, because it's so beautiful. If we actually realized how beautiful it actually was, we might be walking out in front of cars and hoping to get run over or something. We might be more, uh, care, uh, less careful about our lives, and, and so we could just get to heaven sooner. And uh, I, I really believe that. But uh, anyway, so he, he said he, he couldn't even tell us all this. And then he continues to talk about, in the last, next verse there, he says, I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself except about my weaknesses. Well, you know, the Apostle Paul said at one time he could boast about all the good things he had done, but he said, I'm not going to boast about myself. And literally, hopefully at this point, you realize that the Apostle Paul is talking about himself. He saw heaven, but he was trying to be humble about it, which is, we're going to see why. And he said, but what I want to boast about is my weaknesses. Uh, my flaws, my faults, my weaknesses, uh, you know, like the parts, uh, like thorns. I don't walk around bragging to people I got thorns on my property. Uh, but Paul is saying when you really understand what your weaknesses are, they're actually something that God, we're going to see that God can work through your weaknesses. You know, when you have a strength, then all the glory goes to you. Now, or you might try to take all the glory to you, but when you have weaknesses, those are the areas God can really work through. And then he says, even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth. He said, this stuff is really true. But I refrain so no one would think of me more than is warranted by what I do or say. Well, here is Paul. He's been forgiven for murder and everything else and he sees heaven, and he says, I really don't want to bring focus to myself. I want to bring focus to the one who actually uh, purchased me back and give me this wonderful gift so that someday I will be back in paradise in this place. He doesn't want the spotlight on himself. He wants it on Jesus. And, uh, you know, the last part says, not on what I've what I seen, but what I do or say. And sometimes people will have whole ministries because at one point in their life something happened or they did something and uh, they put all their ministry on that. We need to be watching people, watching that their ministry is all that it should be. If someone said, I died and went to heaven, but he's living an ungodly lifestyle, there's a pretty good reason that he probably never did see that. Anyway, Paul continues... But here's what ha had happened. To keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Well, to keep Paul from being too conceited, by the way, except for Jesus Christ, nobody but Paul ever literally saw Jesus. 
And by the way, pride is one of the, the worst sins that all of us have to be so careful with. And so P Paul, God is uh, uh, trying to keep him from getting too proud, but he wanted him to, to tell us that he saw heaven, it's a real place, and that, that God was going to forgive him. And these were surpassingly great revelations, no doubt about it. This was previously unknown to anyone that anybody could see heaven and come back. And by the way, the other thing that was revealed to Paul while he was there is that the Gentiles, which is most of us, were going to be grafted into the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. That was previously unknown but he had that thorn in his flesh. It was a messenger of Satan. God allowed Satan to buffet him and beat him up and to, you know, cause him to be exasperated and all these things and all that. And then he goes on to say, three times, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on me. Well, he's asking God to take it away. And when we have trials and troubles, what do we say? God, take it away. God, take it away. But you know what? We're so short-sighted. We don't realize that some of these things literally cause us to become the, the Christians that we need to be. And he said... But, but the Lord, but he said, my grace, God is letting them know that uh, my grace, my empowering spirit, is, my power is more than enough. My power working through your weakness will more than make up for that which, what your loss, what your loss is. And uh, so he says, I'm going to boast all the more gladly because of that of my weakness so that Christ's power may rest in me. You know what? One of the things that happens when we are weak, we're humble. We know now we ask God to bless things. We ask God to do things. And we kind of get out of God's way. Otherwise, if we're so full of ourselves, we think, God, get out of the way. Let me, let me take care of it. And, and that doesn't work. It just really doesn't work. And that's why, as Paul continues, he said, That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Well, you know what? Uh, we need to get a different attitude about seeing our weaknesses as strengths. Uh, when people insult us and we learn how to accept insult like Jesus did, uh, when we go through hardships and persecutions, that we can go through it like Jesus did, when we have difficulties of any of sort, not to sit there and focus on it, but to realize that God is using all of my difficulties to actually make me a better Christian, a more solid uh, example of Jesus Christ to the people around me. And that's when all these things all came in. And we're going to look a little more at thorns today. Where is all this power coming to do all this? And that's in Matthew 27. They, uh, they said they stripped him. And we know the story of Jesus on the cross and put a scarlet robe on him and then twisted together a crown of thorns. There's those thorns again. Those thorns are there. And, uh, and it set it on his head. And then they put a staff in his right hand and knelt in front of him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Well, he was the promised Messiah, and here he was, and he was suffering for our sins. He even goes on to say a little right after that, they spit on him, and they took a staff, and they beat him with that, and they mocked him, and then later they took him away to crucify him. And here Jesus is showing us, in a sense, it looked like he was weak, but it was where how God used his weaknesses weaknesses to bring his kingdom forward in this world. And then it, and it goes on to say in the next, in 1 Corinthians, to put it all together, it says that for death, for since death came through a man, you remember Adam and Eve, the resurrection of the dead also came through a man. Adam and Eve lost paradise through their short-sightedness, their decision to rebel against God, but by Jesus uh, being 
uh, faithful to God and obeying his word, he caused the resurrection from the dead. And verse 22 says, For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. Jesus Christ suffered on that cross. He, it looked like he was weak, and, but in his weaknesses, while they were abusing him, he caused the whole kingdom uh, of God to change, and every one of us, he purchased our way into paradise. So it says, in Christ, all will be made alive. Because of Adam and Eve, death came into the world. Because of Jesus Christ, we will all be alive with God for all eternity. And as we close out here, I want us to see the final uh, outcome. Here's Paul. He's a murderer. He's killed all these Christians. And now he sees something that's awaiting him. And what is it? It's paradise. It's something that we can't even put in a picture. In Revelation 21, it tells us that at the end, when God has done all the work that he is going to do in the world, it said, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. This old, uh, tainted world will be uh, redone. And then it says, I saw God's holy city coming down from heaven. And I, I heard a uh, voice that said, Now God's dwelling is with men. And I love verse 4. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. Remember we said if we had a perfect world, uh, we wouldn't probably sin. And we said that isn't true. Well, after we go through this imperfect world and we have the tears, we have the pain, we go through the heartache, then God ultimately will return, will restore us, and we will be in heaven for all eternity. And one of the things I want to tell you today is, you know, people, they use these pagan thoughts of what heaven's going to be like, and they talk about little angels floating on clouds, or these kind of spirits floating around, and they, you know, they really don't even have a body and all this kind of stuff, and nobody wants that. What do we want? We want to get back to that garden. We want to be back in paradise. We want to be swimming in these pure, pristine uh, rivers and creeks and all these things that way God originally created it. And that's what God has waiting for all of us. And that's why we, as we are in this world, and we have the thorns, and we have the heartaches, and we have the heartbreaks, it literally is preparing us. And I know it's hard. And it's easy to say that now if I'm, when you're not going into something really bad. But to know that at the moment uh, that we leave here, we're going to be like that thief on the cross. We're going to be in paradise. Oh, praise God. That'll carry us through many things. Well, God bless you and have a wonderful Lord's Day. In Jesus' name, amen.